Amen. So Judges chapter 19. So welcome to the worst story in the Bible as far as, uh, you know, messed up stories in the Bible go, in the Bible, messed up stories in the Bible go. This has got to be uh, easily number one. So uh, there's a lot of things in this story that we're going to go through this evening. The story actually continues uh, for a couple more chapters, but um, we're going to focus on what we can learn from Judges chapter 19 this evening. So let's start out right away. It's a longer chapter, so let's try to get through this verse by verse, and then we'll see what we can apply from this. But look at Judges chapter 19 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning by the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. So a concubine is basically a, a wife of a lesser status, you know, like a servant who's a wife or something along a, a lesser status of, you know, of wife. I mean, you're only supposed to have one wife, but, you know, this was not the way things were going. Look at verse number two. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Bethlehem Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him, and a couple of asses, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. So this woman, uh, this concubine, this wife, leaves her husband and runs back to her father's house. And the Bible says in number, uh, verse number 4, And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him. And he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink and lodge there. And he came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So look at, um, you know, he apparently doesn't, a series of events starts here, where it's kind of obvious that the father-in-law, so the, the daughter has run home to her, to her father, and has left her husband. And her husband comes, and he comes to the father's house where the, his wife is, his concubine is, and, you know, he's trying to bring her back, and the father clearly doesn't want to let her go. He clearly wants her to stay there, and he tries to entice this man to stay in the next few verses through, you know, eating and drinking and just offering him, you know, kind of a, a relaxing time here. Look at verse number six. And he sat down and did eat and drink both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. So he's, he's just convincing him to stay another day, and another day, and another day. He clearly doesn't want his daughter to leave here. Look at verse number 8. And he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And, tarry, and he tarried, they tarried until afternoon. They hung out until afternoon. And they did eat both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to the end. Lodge here, that thine heart may be merry. And tomorrow get you early on your way, that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed, and came over to Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine was also with him. So it's important to note here, he finally on the fifth day, he says, you know, I'm not going to stay. He's like, I'm not doing this another night. He's like, I have to go. So he decides to leave, but it's important to note that he leaves in the evening. He leaves towards nighttime. So he's, you know, mo most of the time when you're going to travel, you would get up early and you would travel during the daylight hours so you would have enough time to, you know, find a place, settle in, and, and spend the night if you had to spend the night. But this guy leaves towards the evening, and that kind of begins this series of unfortunate events, if you want to call it that, um, to be, you know, to say the least. Look at verse 11. And then we're by Jabus, Jabus, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into this city of the Jebusites, and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. So here they were in this area that was not part of you know, the, pro or the children of Israel's, one of the tribes, and he didn't want to stay in the country of a stranger, of the heathen. So he wanted to stay in, which kind of gives you an idea as we read the rest of the story on how far things have fallen in this society. 
I mean, if the children of Israel, the Benjamites, were where they were in this story, where were the people outside? You know, what were those cities like? Because we can see that this city was, um, was pretty far gone. Look at verse 12. So he says, we're going to go and we're going to find a city of our brethren. Okay, verse 12. And his master said unto him, verse 13, sorry, and his servant, he said unto his servant, come and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. So now they're just north of Judah in Benjamin, and they decide it gets dark, and they decide they're going to stop here. And they turned aside thither to go in and lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodge. So it was either, it was either you know, it was typical that they would bring in strangers or they would bring in travelers into um, the house, but at this point, it was either too late at this point or it was just not a friendly place. Okay, and we kind of find out, you know, what was going on um, in this place in a few verses. But basically, they get into the city, it's dark, and they basically sit down on the street because nobody invites them into their house. Okay, so verse 16, and behold, there came, so here they are, they're in the dark and they're on the street in this city of Gibeah, which is of the Benjamites. It's, it's a city of the tribe of Israel, of one of the tribes of the children of Israel. So it's not like... It's not like they're out in a Canaanite city here. They're actually in a city that is of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're in, they're in Benjamin. It's just north of Jerusalem. Okay, So this kind of gives you an idea. Just picture this on where this nation had, had, had found itself at this point in history in Judges chapter 19. Look at verse 16. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field, at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he, so, he sojourned in Gibeah. He stayed there. But the men of the place were Benjamites. So this man, he's coming, from, coming home late from work, and he sees these, these people. He sees this, this man, his servant, and his wife staying in the street. In verse 17, And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man. Wayfaring means a traveling man. It means a man who's traveling a lot of times on foot, you know, a, a traveling man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? He says, Where are you going, and where did you come from? He's basically shocked to see them there. Okay? He's, you know, he's, he's basically kind of saying to them, Clearly you're not from around here. <laughs> okay? So he says this to the, to the guy, and the, the, the Levite says back, and he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence I am, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for thine handmaid, and for the young man which is, thy, which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. So he basically says, we're heading back to Jerusalem. He said, we're heading back to, you know, Jerusalem. He says, but, you know, no one, no one brought us in. He's like, but we have everything we need here. He's like, we have food, we have drink. He's like, we have straw for the, the animals. He's like, we're fine. We don't need anything. You know, he's basically saying, thank you. Thank you for asking. All right, look at verse 20. And the old man said, peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. So this guy, this guy knows Okay, this guy knows the state of this city. And at this point, I mean, at this point in Judges chapter 19, verse number 20, it kind of starts to read like a horror story. You know, this guy is, is you know, think of a horror story that you've, you've read or heard of. This guy is saying, you know, it's dark now. These people are in the street. He's like, hey, hey, but just, you just don't stay here. You can't stay here. Just come with me. Just come with me. Let's get out of the street. Because he knows that there's something wrong here. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 11. It's dark. It's dangerous. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So Ephesians 5.11 is saying that evil things, wicked things, we're not supposed to have anything to do with them, but I like how it points out the fact that many times evil, wicked things are done in the dark. 
evil with wicked things, evil wicked people, they come out in the dark. And you think about where evil wicked things happen, even in this world that we live in today, it's in the dark. You think about places where you would go, you know, casinos, bars, nightclubs, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, why are they always dark? Why so dark? Why so dark all the time? But here it's dark, there's evil wicked people, it's a bad combination. It's a bad combination of things. Go back to Judge, Judges chapter 19. So now the story, you know, like I said, this is the worst story in the entire Bible that I, that I can think of. I mean, I'm not, it's not even close, there's not even a close second, in my opinion. And we're going to talk about why that is, but look at verse number 21. So this man gets them off the street. He takes them off the street and he brought them into his house and gave provender unto the asses. He gave them, you know, food and he's taking care of the animals. And they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now, verse 22, as they were making their hearts merry, behold the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, underline that in your Bible, sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Now I'm not going to, I don't have time for the sermon tonight to explain what, you know, to go through the Bible study of what it means to, you know, that we may know him. But basically the Bible speaks of that, of, you know, physical relations between, uh, you know, a man and his wife. It's a, it's a physical, you know, relationship, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, so that's what these men are they're saying they're surrounded the house, they're beating at the door, and they spoke to the master of the house saying, so they're men of the city saying, bring us the man that came so we may know him. These were sodomites outside the door. These were wicked sodomites outside the door. And the Bible calls them sons of Belial here. What does that mean? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Sons of Belial. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 15. Let's look at what this, this sons of Belial means before we continue with the story. Look at verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says this, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So Belial is used as a synonym for Satan in the Bible. It means the same Thing. They're talking about the same person. So he's saying in Judges chapter 19 that these were sons of Satan or sons of the devil is what it's talking about. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. The phrase comes up several times in the Bible. We'll look at a few of them. But what does that mean? So these were sons of Satan. Look, if you're saved, you know, you're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a son or daughter of God. On the other hand, you have these people that are sons of Belial, sons of Satan. What does that mean? Look at 2 Samuel chapter 23. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made me an everlasting covenant, ordering in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns, underline this in your Bible, thrust away. As thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. Thrust away. So the sons of Belial, in, in verse number 5, it is talking about salvation, or somebody that is saved. In verse number 6, it says, but these sons of Belial are like thorns that are thrust away. Kind of like rejected. Okay, so they are something that has been rejected or thrust away, kind of like given up, gave up, given over. Gave them over. These people were rejected by God. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. So the first point I want to make about the sons of Belial is that they have been rejected by God. They've been thrust away by God. You say, prove it. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and look at verse number 12. I'll prove it to you right here. Eli had certain sons, and they were considered, they were called sons of Belial in the Bible. 
So the Bible says this in verse number 12. It says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Now what does that mean? They knew not the Lord. So first of all, it means that they were not saved. So in verse number 12, they are called sons of Belial, and it says they knew not the Lord, which means they were not saved. Well, you say, well, they, they could get saved. They could get saved. Okay, let's keep reading. Go down to verse number 25. So here we had these sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord, meaning they were not saved. Verse 25. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father. So in between verse 12 and verse 25, Eli tries to correct his sons. They're doing wicked things. They're stealing from people. They're committing fornication with people. I mean, they're priests. And they're committing fornication with the people at the, at the temple. They're doing these wicked things. The Bible calls them sons of Belial. They were not saved. But maybe God wanted them to get saved. But look at the end of verse 25. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father. Imagine that. Sons of Belial, and they didn't listen to the godly advice of their father. And, and why? Why? Notice it doesn't say, therefore the Lord would slay them. Notice it doesn't say that. It says, they hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. Do you see? The deal was sealed with these men. Sons of Belial are people that are thrust away, they're rejected, they're, they're not only not saved, but the Lord does not want them saved. The Lord has given them up, has given them over. Look, you will see this. You will see this. Turn to John chapter 12. You will see this out soul winning. But let's go to uh, John chapter 12 and look at verse number 40. I mean, the Bible, I mean, so the, you have a certain group of people, these sons of Belial, that the Lord, they're not saved, and God doesn't want them saved. It, it's, it's too late for them. It's over at that point. They're sons of Belial, you know, because the Lord would slay them. You know, they didn't listen to the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. Look, they were done. It was too late. Look at John chapter 12 and verse number 40. The Pharisees, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus himself talked about the Pharisees in the same manner also. Look at verse 40 of John chapter 12. Look, talking about the Pharisees as though he didn't want them to understand. He didn't want them to be saved. I mean, they were done to him. You say, prove it. Look at verse 40, John 12. He hath blinded their eyes. Did that say their eyes were blinded? He blinded their eyes. Why would he do that? He, he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. He blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart. That they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart. Why? Because they might be converted. That's why. So let me read the whole thing for you. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. He said, look, I hardened their heart. I blinded them because I don't want them to be converted and I don't want them to be healed. It's too late for them. So it can get to a point with people where it's too late for them. Where it's too late. And the sons of Belial, that is describing people that have been that have been beyond that point. Amen. They cannot be saved. Go back to Judges chapter 19. You will see this out soul winning. You will see this out soul winning. This is why you need to be a soul winner. So you can understand the world you're living in. Amen. I mean, not only because you're supposed to, and it's a command from God, but look, you want to understand the world you're, you're living in? You got to become a soul winner. You will not see a, a homosexual get saved, ever. Amen. And look, we don't discriminate. Because quite frankly, when I moved to California, I couldn't tell. I thought half the men here were, were homos. Men are so effeminate here, it's ridiculous. But, I mean, you can't tell. So we just give the gospel to anybody. We don't have to worry about it. Because look, they're not going to believe. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. We preach the gospel to everybody. They're not going to believe. They can't. They can't believe. It's, it, it'll be proven to you if you're a soul winner. Become a soul winner, you'll see it again and again. Turn it back to Judges chapter 19. So we see these sons of Belial. They're reprobates. They're rejected by God. They're rejected by God. Look at verse 23. 
Look at verse 23. And the man, so they've asked, they said, bring the man out to us. They said, bring the man out to us that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you. He's saying, no, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into mine house, do not this folly. Now look, I want to point out the word folly. Underline that in your Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Or you turn to Joshua chapter 7. I'll just read for you Deuteronomy chapter 22 for sake of time. Then they shall bring out Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 21. Every single time. So what did we preach about Sunday morning? Not all sin is equal. Not all sin is equal in the eyes of God. It's a false doctrine, easily proven from the Bible, easily disproven from the Bible. When you see the word folly in the Bible, we are talking about very serious sin. When you see the word folly. Deuteronomy 22, 21. Then shall they bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. So here was a woman who committed fornication and wasn't a maiden, and this was the punishment for it, and it's called folly, and it was punished by death. Joshua chapter 7, look at verse 15. And it shall be that that he is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. So he's talking about idol worship. And he, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Talking about you know, the accursed thing, taking things that weren't yours that God said to leave. Look, it's a very serious sin, and it's punished by death here. When it says folly, it's serious, and it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Not all sin is equal. Finally, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And before we continue, just let me show you the consistency of the Bible. Before we continue into this story and see what happens in the next few verses, let me show you the consistency of the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 29. We're talking about people who've been given over, who've been given up, who God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They've been rejected. And we're talking about a description. It talks about homosexuality in the verses before this. But then it gives a much more detailed description of what these sons of Belial, these rejected people, are like. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. That's what got it all started in the beginning. Look, God didn't start this with these people. We know what everybody was given from, the, from birth in this earth is, is, is a conscience, is the law written in their heart. But haters of God, they hated God, and eventually God rejected them. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, they're unnatural people. Implacable, unmerciful. Implacable means they can't be appeased. Implacable means that, that they... It's interesting that implacable is used there because uh, uh, you know, implacable means that they can't be rendered peaceful. That there's no, there's no hey, let's work this out. You know, like, look at what we're going to see in Judges chapter 19. This is what the two men tried to do. They tried to placate the situation. They tried to, you know, appease the situation in a, in a horribly wicked way, we're going to see. But they tried to appease the situation, but they can't be appeased. These sons of Abelio, they can't be appeased. They can't be satisfied. It's, it's, it's evil that can't be calmed down. It can't be stopped. And what's the last one? Unmerciful. Now let's look and, and continue reading Judges 19 and see if this story matches with what Romans 1 tells us. Look back at Judges chapter 19 and verse number 24. Look, this is what sons of Belial are. This is what reprobates are. They've turned on God and God has turned on them. God has rejected them. Look, and all sodomites are reprobates. We know that from the Bible because, look, it's a sign. It's cause and effect. It's the effect of turning on God. Just one of them. Just one of them. Look at Judges 19, chapter 24, or verse number 24. 
It's what has happened through the process of Romans 1. Think of Romans 1 as a process that someone has gone through, someone has chosen to go through in their life. Look at verse 24. Now they're trying to placate the situation, but they're implacable. They're trying to appease. They're trying to stop. They're trying to, you know, just make this problem go away somehow. And look at what these men do. Behold, this, this old man that brings in this stranger, he doesn't even know this man. This is what he says. Here is my daughter, a maiden. Meaning she's never been with a man. And his concubine. Them I will bring out. And humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vile a thing. So now this is really messed up. And now is where, the, I mean, the story is like, I mean, look, everything you read in the Bible, just remember, everything in you read, that you read in the Bible, it, it, this is history, this happened, but it was, it's history, not doctrine. Okay, this, this was messed up. This was not right, what was happening here, on, on, on both sides. <laughs> okay, look at verse 25. But the men would not hearken unto him. Imagine that. They would not be appeased. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until morning, and the day began to spring. They let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman and his concubine, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, let us be going. Nice guy. Nice guy. Can't imagine why she didn't want to stay with him. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what in the world is wrong with this guy? But none answered. Then the man took her upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. She's dead. They killed her. So they abused her to death in this story. Verse 29. And he was come into his house. He took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. What in the world? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 11. There is, I, I was looking, and there is nothing in the Bible that is close to this. It, the closest thing I could find was in 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11. But, I mean, this just shows you how messed up things had gotten, how fallen things had gotten in this society, even in, Israel, in the, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel at this time. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 11. But he takes her body, he cuts it into 12 pieces, and he sends it to the tribes of Israel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible says this, And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them to pieces and sent them through all the... This was when, you know, the children of Israel were under attack and the king said to them, the king that was attacking them said, Hey, you know, thrust out your eyes you know, and then, you know, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll let you live. And it was this horrible thing that was happening. And they, and they sent to Saul for reinforcements. And this is what Saul did. He took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. So, Saul used this as a way to bring an army together, but he cut up some cattle and saying, look, I'm going to cut up all your cattle if you don't come fight for this city. And there, there's no precedent for what this Levite did to his concubine. It was, uh, you know, it, it even, turn to Deuteronomy 21. There's no precedent for, to cut up a person like this. And, and as a matter of fact, in the Bible, even criminals that were put to death were given a burial. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, look at verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23. And if a man hath committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. This is talking about somebody that you've given the death penalty to, and you hung him. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he, is, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. 
that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So even criminals in, you know, biblical law were to be buried and given a burial. This guy, you know, he's, and look at verse 30 to end off Judges chapter 19, and it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your mind. So in Judges chapter 20, he sends a message saying, he, that, that, that's his way of sending a letter that, of what happened to his, con, his wife, is by cutting up her body and sending it to the 12 tribes. You're like, it's, there's no biblical precedent for that. It, it's, it's, it's messed up in itself. But we see that this man and the old man were far from moral men in the first place. Okay, so they were faced with this situation. Judges chapter 20, we'll look at how the, the nation of Israel deals with the Benjamites and the men that committed this crime, and, you know, the men that committed the crime and the people that support them, by the way. But tonight, what I want to do, as far as application tonight, I want to look at the Levite tonight. I want to look at the man who thrust his wife out the door in this story. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Because really, Really, I mean, that tells us kind of the depth of the fallen society because these were the good guys in the story. You know, these were the, the normal, non-reprobate people in the story. But look, they were far from acting in a biblical manner. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives. Okay, so what does that even mean? Love your wives. I mean, I love my wife. I mean, I love my wife, you know, but what does that mean? Well, it gives us some pretty detailed direction here. It says, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gets even more specific, and gave himself for it. So look, to be a biblical husband, to, for this Levite to be a biblical husband, he would have had to have been prepared, and to be a biblical husband, you have to be prepared to sacrifice your life for your wife. I mean, look, and, and not throw her to the wolves. I mean, to me, that is the most disturbing part of this story. I mean, the, the, the reprobate part, the sodomite part, I mean, look, reprobates are going to reprobate. I mean, we know the Bible, I mean, that matches with what the Bible says that they will be like. It matches perfectly to Romans chapter 1. But this is seriously disturbing in, with this Levite and the old man. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, the Bible says that your wife is the weaker vessel. Your wife is the weaker vessel. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7. And the Bible says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So the question is, if we're supposed to love our wives, love our, our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, turn to John chapter 18, the question is, how did Christ protect the church? How did Christ act towards the church? How does Christ act towards the saved? Look at verse uh, 3 of John chapter 18. I mean, because there, there is a situation where Jesus himself, before he died, was actually put in a situation like this. He was put in a situation where, you know, he had to make a decision. Look at John 18, verse 3. Judas then, so this is Judas coming with the band of soldiers to the garden to arrest Jesus. Having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? He said, the, the soldiers and Judas come, and Jesus says, Who are you after? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. So Jesus, they come, they come and they say, We're looking for Jesus. He didn't grab Peter and be like, Here he is, it's this guy. You know, that's the Levite, right? He said, it's me. He said, it's me. I am Jesus. He didn't push Peter in front, and they're the disciples in, in front. So look, we are to protect our families as Christ protected the church. 
and gave himself for it. He died. He went all the way to protect us from hell. So look, go back to Ephesians chapter 5. You say, so men are supposed to protect their wives and their families. But look back at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 28. So the first thing, I mean, this is, I'm going to go, I'm going to give you the ways that you need to protect your wife and your families, and I'm going to go from easy to hard this evening. We're going to start with the easy stuff. So here's the first one. Here's the easy one. You are to protect your wife and your family from physical danger. Men, you young men, you want to get married. You are signing up to protect your future wife from physical danger. Like if someone would want to physically harm them, that's your job to protect that. Look at Ephesians 5.28. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. You know how Genesis 2 says that they became, the two became one flesh? So basically protecting your wife against physical danger is exactly the same biblical rules as self-defense. As protecting yourself. So if someone is attacking my wife, or my children, they're attacking me. And the same rules apply. So look, I mean, you are to protect your wife. If someone is attacking, their, attacking her, attacking your children, they're attacking you. That's what the Bible says. And you're supposed to protect from that. So I mean, yes, being married means that you may have to protect your family from physical danger, man. You may have to defend your wife or kids. I mean, this one seems obvious. I, I, assume, I assume that all men would be okay with this. I assume. Look, this is when it's okay. This is when it's okay to become a striker. When some son of Belial takes a swing at your son, it's okay to become a striker. At that point, I mean, it's easy for me because I just see red and I don't even remember what happened afterwards. It's only happened a couple times in my life, but it's just like I just kind of I like black out and then pretty soon somebody's on the ground. But that's the way you need to be. Okay? That's the way you need to be. Most men, look, but here's the problem. Most men today, and we're living in such a comfortable society that quite frankly, we're just getting too soft. You know, the American life, this American male, this American life that we're all living, we're just, we're just too soft. We're like anti-confrontation. We're like anti... But look, there is times when confrontation is necessary. Right. Is necessary to protect your wife as you would protect yourself. So that's an easy one. You're like, oh, no problem. No problem. I will have no problem protecting my family against physical danger. You say, this is easy. Sign me up for this sermon. But here's one. This is where men today, here's the second one. Here's where men today are completely falling apart. Here's where Christian men today are completely following, falling short. Is this, the danger. Are you protecting your wife? Are you protecting your families against the danger of influence in their lives? We talk a lot about separation here. I mean, separation, you're like, oh, separation again? We talk so much about separation and the importance of it in this church. You know, we have this, this idea that we should, you know, separate, at times, separate from friends. We should be separating from certain family. But here's, like, what's the separation methodology? Here's, I was talking to one of you the other night about this. Here's, your, here's the separation methodology. I don't care if they're family. I don't care if they're friends. I don't care how long you've known them. Here's the methodology. Here's your bubble. Here's your family bubble, men. And I'm talking to the men. Because this is your job. Here's your bubble. Where do, you, where do you draw those lines? You draw the lines of when people are starting to influence inside your bubble. And I'm going to give you two points. I'm going to give you two areas that that influence will come in that you need to protect against. So here's an example for you. Here's an example. For, just, just the other night, Sunday night, we had, you know, look, influence, and I'm telling you, influence is a danger unestimated, underestimated. It's seriously underestimated. There's two dangers. The first ones are spiritual influence, and the second one is just is the influ is outside influence. But spiritual influence is it's, it's, there's a reason for this separation, folks. Let me give you an example. 
The, the other night, Sunday night, we had some visiting kids here, and there was just a ton of people in the church, and there was all kinds of games going on, and there was you know, teenagers at the piano, and teenagers playing table tennis or whatever, and I'm looking around, I'm looking around and I'm seeing the situation, and I'm realizing that, you know, there would be, I mean, the kids, if you would ask any of the kids from, from five years old, or from two years old, all the way up to 20 years old in, in the church that night, I bet you that the majority of them would have told you that they couldn't have possibly had a better time. They were having so much time fellowshipping and just hanging out, just having a, a, a great time at church with their brothers and sisters in Christ. But do you know that there, if there was a kid that came from outside, a 16-year-old kid, a 17-year-old kid that came from outside that had never been to church before and came into that situation, do you know they wouldn't have fun? Did you know that they, they wouldn't have fun standing around the piano, you know, singing hymns? They, they wouldn't have fun, you know, doing that. They would be like this... Look, they wouldn't have fun at first if they got into church and they started, you know, listening to the Bible and they, you know, of course, if they got saved and then just started growing in Christ, then they would have fun. But at first, they would not have fun in that situation. You say, why? The reason is influence. The reason is the influence that has been had on them in their life. And look, if they were 12 and came in, they wouldn't have fun. You say, that's pretty young. Yeah. You would be surprised, and most parents, especially parents of young kids, underestimate the dangers of this influence in their kids' lives. And look, back to who I'm talking to, it's, it, dad, husband, it's your job to protect against this. It is your job. So look, it can happen to Christian kids. It happens all the time, this outside influence. It, and look, it can come subtly. It can come subtly. So what are the two ways? Just spiritual attacks is the first one. Spiritual attacks. They're subtle. They're subtle. Spiritual attacks. Just look at this. You know, you're, we're, we're big on homeschooling here, right? We're big on homeschooling. And look, you're, that's going to separate you from people when you start homeschooling. You're going to be separate from people. And you're going to deal. You're going to deal. Look, your wife is going to deal with attacks because of that. And look, they're, they're not... They're not even going to be the worst ones or the subtle ones. You ever heard of gaslighting? The worst ones are the subtle ones, where maybe they just don't mention the achievements of your school program. Where maybe there's friends or family that just won't mention the achievements of your children in their education, but they'll mention the achievements of other children. That's called gaslighting. They're these subtle little attacks. Because look, moms, if, if done right, this homeschooling, this homeschooling will take all your effort. This homeschooling will take all your effort. I don't care if you have one child or two children or five children. If you have two children at home and they're young and you're, and you're bored, you're not doing it right. You're bored, you're like, what am I supposed to do all day? My kids are only four. Look, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You're missing something. You're not doing what you should be doing. But look, if you, once you do get going, and that's going to be a big push for this ministry, is to make sure that this homeschooling is done thoroughly, done properly, and done well. Because we want solid Christian education. I'm big on education. I love it. But here's the thing. If you're doing it with all your heart, and then people just like don't recognize that, and they're just subtly attacking you. And look, man, you have to watch for this happening with your wife. Because you're going to go through attacks like this. And that's why, I mean, if I see this happening with my, with my family, if somebody is attacking my wife in that area, like, it's nuclear bomb time. I go out, I got a trailer full of nuclear bombs. And, and if I find somebody attacking my bubble, even in the most subtle gaslighting way, you must stop that. You must get that influence out. Because that is the most important thing that is happening in your family. And she's the weaker vessel, and she needs to be protected by you. It's your job. It's your job. You know, gaslighting is where you could, you know, you, you see subtle things, and then you call people out, and they're so subtle where they could be like, oh, I, I didn't even know that, that I was saying, that I was, that I was omitting that achievement of your children or whatever. And then it, you, you ask yourself, am I crazy? It's like psychological warfare. But you know it's happening. It's going to happen to you. And men, you need to recognize it and you need to stop it. You need to stop it. 
And look, and if you don't, if you see that happening and you see these subtle attacks and you do nothing, you're a coward, just like the Levite was a coward. Church, if they start attacking church, it's the same thing. Same thing, attacking the fact that you go to church, attacking where you go to church, attacking your beliefs. All these subtle things are super damaging. They're super damaging on your, on your children at a young age. They're damaging. So that's the spiritual attacks. Those are coming, and you need to recognize those men, and you need to protect against them. The next ones are the influential influence, the attacks of influence. Now, the obvious ones are like sin, right? Like people that, you know, they want to, you know, there's you know, sin. They want to expose, you know, you go over to so-and-so's house, and there's drinking there, or so-and-so's in fornication. And, look, like, this is pretty easy, you know? You're like, oh, yeah, we'll never be around that stuff. That's pretty easy, right? It's easy to fix. It's easy to fix. It's easy to recognize. Yet many men won't. Why? Many men, well, that's just cousin so-and-so. That's just uncle so-and-so. That's just this guy that I've known for however many years. But look, it is the same reason. Your bubble is the same reason we have all these rules in the church. It's the same reason that we can't allow fornication here. It's the same reason that we can't allow drunkenness here. It's the same reason that there's all these rules. It's the same reason I can't have a man in this church that just refuses to work. It just it can't happen. Why? Because it will, it will influence the church. That's why. Because if I sit up here and I preach that, you know, men should work, and then half the men in the church just don't work. They just collect checks from the government, from the rest of us that are working. We're, I'm a joke. The church becomes a joke. What I'm preaching becomes a joke. It's the, same, it's the same thing with you. If we stand up here and we preach separation, we preach all these things, and you just allow this influence in your family, your kids are going to be like, yeah, I know we go to church and they teach this, but this is how things really work. And they'll realize that when they're five. They'll realize that when they're six. But even subtle things, even subtle things like TV, video games, etc., these are all very damaging things that will change your children. All because, and look, all because men will not protect their families. I mean, we're, we're witnessing, we're witnessing, we're witnessing in Judges chapter 19, we're witnessing a fallen society. And, and it's, just like, it's just like what's happening today. It's a fallen society. And if you don't protect against it, if you don't protect your wife and your family against it, look, your wife is going to get beat down emotionally because she's the weaker vessel. I'm glad that my wife is a more emotional person than me. Because you know what? It balances things out. It's the way it's supposed to be. Because when I'm hard-nosed with the kids, then, you know, there's a balance there. But that must be protected. That's where you come in. So look, men today are too weak. The Levite, the old man, they were cowards. And men today, I mean, take my daughter. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, look, the, the reason, look, the reason that I focus so much about this, the reason I focus so much on this is because, and, and look, I, I don't know, I don't know how I can get this across. We're going to talk about it a little bit on Sunday morning. We're going to talk about, you know, kids that just leave the church. Kids that just, I mean, have you ever heard of these kids that were raised in a fundamental church and they just turn on the church? They were raised in a fundamental environment and they just, we're going to, we're going to talk about why that happens on Sunday morning and how you can avoid it happening with your children. But the thing I want to get across is this. Your kids are, you, you know, these kids, you know, they're going to get saved. They're, but you're not in the clear. I mean, I don't know how to get across more seriously that, that we, you think, oh, my kids are young. I don't have to worry about things. I mean, most people have very young kids here. Look, they're not too young to be influenced. I don't care how young they are. They are not too young to be influenced. And, and listen to me, folks. We are playing for all the marbles here. Because when your kid, when your child is influenced and they grow up to be that 12, that 13 year old that, that doesn't want to be in church, that doesn't want to be, that doesn't, that doesn't have fun or doesn't feel uh, 
you know, at home with the spiritual things because they've been influenced and they're looking out there. And they're like, oh, but, but these things. Oh, but this. Look, there's no joy out there. But they'll be drawn to that. They'll be drawn to that, and, and you must protect it like a bulldog, like a pit bull, like a crazy pit bull. Because we're, we're playing for everything. We're playing for everything, and the danger is real. And the impressions made on them will not go away. The things that they see will not go away. Your mind, your mind is, like, is like an endless video recorder. They've done studies on your mind. They don't even know how much data that it can hold. The things your kids see, the, ki the things that people say will stick with them. I can remember things that people said to me when I was four years old, five years old. Think about that. All it takes is someone just, hey, look at that. Hey, what do you think about this? I mean, you must protect this situation. Don't be like the Levite. He was only interested in protecting himself. And he threw his wife to the wolves. I mean, these, this, this is a lesson. Judges 19 is a, is a, is a messed up story. We're going to talk about how it was dealt with next week. But I want to get across the importance of protecting your family in a fallen society. Because that is the job that you have tonight. If you are married, and especially if you are married and have children, you have this job of protecting your family from a wicked, fallen world. And the attacks are subtle, but they're real. And you're going to deal with them. And unfortunately, people underestimate it, and they don't take it seriously. But the stakes are as, as serious as they can get. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.